Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where today I teach you an expansion to a game, because almost every game can be improved and Root is no exception. Now if you haven't played Root, check out my tutorial for that before watching this one, but if you already know the base game and you're ready to punch it up a little, then the Riverfolk expansion is what you need. This expansion adds four main things. There are two completely new factions, including the titular Riverfolk Company and the Devious Lizard Cult, which means you can bring the player count up to six if you want. There's another Vagabond board and tile set, allowing you to have two Vagabonds in play, as well as three new Vagabond identities to choose from. And lastly, there's a board for an AI version of the Cats, allowing you to play this game solo, to play a cooperative variant, or just fill out the player count. There are also these scenario tokens, which don't have official rules, but can be used for scenarios that uh, later games puts out. Links in the description. And we're going to go through each edition in turn, so let's start off simple with a new Vagabond board. Of course, if you want to skip ahead, there are links in the description below, as well as an errata list in case I get anything wrong and need to update it later. Hopefully that won't happen. But remember, there's been a balance update that I'll be using that's changed the lizards quite a bit. It's also why you'll be seeing some paper printouts. But anyway, to the rules! Adding a second Vagabond is pretty easy to do, but there are a couple key differences. First off, each rune is going to get two random items instead of one. When you explore a rune with two items, look at them both and choose one, placing the other back under the ruin's token. When the second item gets taken, either by you or the other Vagabond, then the ruin goes away. An important note is that you can't have two of the same ruin items, so if you look under a rock and see two ruin items you already have, you won't get either, your torch will still be exhausted, and you don't get a point for the exploration. Sad day. Now, randomly pick one Vagabond to set up first. That player is probably going to win the whole game, so maybe just like pack up and go home. Or I guess you can go through the formality of playing, but <laughs> right? Now, if you do play through, though, you'll have three new Vagabond character options. The Vagrant, who starts fights amongst other players. The Arbiter, either a paladin or a hero for hire, depending on how you look at it. And the Scoundrel, a psychopath. Neither player has to choose any of these new identities. You can pick the old ones if you want. These are just new options. And that's all for the Vagabond. Next up is the Mechanical Marquise. There are two main reasons you might want to have the Mechanical Marquise in a game. Either you want to play a normal competitive game and just want another player in there, or if you want to play a solo or cooperative game against an AI opponent. If they're replacing a player, the win conditions remain the same, but if you're playing cooperatively, in order to win, each faction must get to 30 points before the cats do. There will also be a couple of other changes, which I'll get into later. No matter which way you're playing, though, you'll need to alter setup in a few minor ways. First off, give the cats a random seating position as if it were another player. Then remove the dominance cards from the game and add the four spy cards. If you're playing a solo game, also remove the three favor of cards. Draw five cards for the cats instead of three, and place them in a row on the card stand so you can't see what they have. This is their schedule of orders, and will determine how they play during the game. After that, when making the item supply, take a sword, boot, bag, and teapot from the supply, and place it on the cat's faction board. And lastly, set up the cats like you normally would, ignoring rules 3 and 4, which set up buildings. The mechs have no need for such trivial things as wood and handshakes. Once they're set up, the cats will follow a set of instructions every turn. During birdsong, they'll score two victory points for each clearing they rule and have at least three warriors, plus one for each human player if you're playing co-op. When daylight hits, reveal the first card in their schedule and take the next three actions in order. Initiate a battle in each clearing matching the suit of the card. If there are no enemies, there's no fight. If there are multiple enemies, the priority goes like this. Most pieces in the clearing, most points, then highest setup priority using the letters on the back of each player's faction board. If there are multiple battles to be fought, use the clearing priority map to determine the order, going from low to high. And the board is two-sided, one for the autumn map and one for winter. After battle, the cats might move. Starting with the lowest matching number in the priority map, in each clearing the cats rule with four or more warriors, move all but three cats to an adjacent clearing. The destination is the clearing with the most enemy pieces, or if that's tied, the lowest number in the priority map. And lastly, the cats will recruit based on the crafting cost of the card, one for each symbol on each matching clearing they rule, or if you're playing co-op, each matching clearing regardless of rule. And it's important to keep in mind, we aren't looking at the suit of the card anymore. We're looking at the suit of the crafting cost. So in this case, you place one cat on each bunny clearing they rule. 
If the card shows one of each suit, place one warrior in every clearing they roll. And for this card, place four warriors in the clearing with the keep. As always, place in priority order, so if you run out of cats, you'll know where to put them. You'll also be screwed, but cross that bridge when you get to it. Now, if the card didn't have a crafting cost, reveal the next card in the order and start it all over again until the cats are able to recruit or run out of cards. Then discard all revealed cards and start the evening, where they'll draw back up to five, placing new cards in the back of the schedule. Now, there are a few special rules for these robotic felines, namely their lack of manual dexterity, which means they don't have a hand of cards, they have their schedule. Because of this, you can't take from or give cards to them. If you would take a card, draw one instead. If you'd give them one, discard it, and then they get a point. Their other rule is that they hate surprises, which means you can't play ambush cards on them. Bummer, right? And let's also talk about the spy cards. They replace the dominance cards and have the same rules about how, when you discard them, they're made available for other players to take. If you do play a spy, during daylight, you can reveal one of the cat's cards. If it matches the suit of the spy card, discard the spy, making it available. If it doesn't match, you may swap any two orders in the schedule. And that's mostly how you play with the cats. There's also rules for a co-op campaign mode on the back of the manual, but it's pretty bare bones and the cats are tough enough as it is, so take it or leave it. But now, let's move on to what we're really here for, the new playable factions, starting with the Lizard Cults. Are they dangerous, or are they just misunderstood? Well, they're definitely weird, so let's talk about how. Your setup letter is F, so you're pretty far back, but that's fine. Start by finding the corner clearing opposite the cat's keep or the bird's starting roost. If both are in play, just pick another corner clearing. Place four warriors and a garden there. Then place one warrior in each adjacent clearing. Once you're done with that, place the remaining gardens on your board and choose an outcast. This is an important decision, but don't worry about it just yet. Let's just say we chose foxes and move on. We're actually going to move on past Birdsong, too. Uh, we'll get back to them in a minute. So, in daylight, all of your actions are fueled by cards. You can reveal a mouse, fox, or rabbit card to build a garden in a matching clearing that you rule, or place a warrior in any matching clearing. And you can reveal a bird card to place one of your warriors from the map or your supply in the Acolytes box. More on all of that later. But notice, I said reveal, and not spend or discard. These basic rituals that you perform just require you to reveal the card. You can reveal as many cards as you have in your hand and take that many actions. The only ritual that requires you to discard a card is also the main way you score points. Your goal is to place a lot of your gardens on the board. Once you have more than one garden of the same suit out, you can discard a matching card and score points. So, if you have two bunny gardens out, then you'll get two points for each bunny you discard. Now, the reason that the lizards are weird about revealing and discarding cards is that there's a big rule change when you're playing with the lizard cult, which is that every time a card is discarded or spent, instead of going to the discard pile, they go to your board and become lost souls. During birdsong, you'll check to see what the most common suit is in the lost souls, ignoring birds, and that will become the new outcast. If there's a tie, or if the most common suit matches the current outcast, flip the marker to the hated outcast side. Then, whatever happens, discard all lost souls into the regular discard pile. Now this outcast and those acolytes we made earlier are going to fuel your most powerful actions, your conspiracies. At the end of Birdsong, you can spend acolytes to perform conspiracies in outcast clearings. And if you have a hated outcast, all your conspiracies will be one acolyte cheaper. For two acolytes, you can crusade, battling in any outcast clearing, or moving units from an outcast clearing and battling in the space they move to. That's cool, I guess, but also for two acolytes, you can convert, removing an enemy warrior in an outcast clearing and putting one of your own warriors in its place. Very sneaky. And for a whopping three acolytes, you can sanctify, removing an enemy building from an outcast clearing and placing a garden where the building was. They're all strong abilities, but remember, they're tied to the outcast, and your opponents may try to discard cards to manipulate what the outcast is, so don't sleep on that. Jumping ahead to evening, you return your revealed cards to your hand. You can craft cards using only gardens matching the outcast suit, and then you draw one card plus one for each card symbol showing, and discard down to five. Now, if you're thinking the Lizard Cult is going to be hard to play, well, yeah, kind of, but they have some special rules which help them out a lot. Starting with Revenge, which states that whenever you're defending, all of your defeated warriors become acolytes. Even in death, they serve the cult. 
Next is their hatred of birds, which means that for rituals, bird cards are not wild for you. I guess that one's not um, helpful, but this uh, next one is, see, because you are on a divine pilgrimage. So you rule any clearing where you have at least one garden, regardless of whatever that clearing looks like. Unfortunately, if a garden gets removed, you'll have to discard one random card from your hand. And that's the lizard cult. Spread like wildfire, assimilate your enemies, and build a war machine out of the corpses of your brethren. And like, frolic in a garden. Last up, the river folk. Ah yes, these otters may be adorable, but as with capitalism in general, they can be dangerous when left unchecked. In this game, all it requires is some finesse and a good deal of business savvy. So, let's build an empire. Your setup letter is G, so you're going after everyone else. But your setup is easy. Simply place four warriors on any clearings along the river. Then, fill your trade posts up, place three warriors in the payments box, and set your prices. The otters are very different from the other factions in that you have three services that each other player can purchase from you at the very beginning of their turn. They do so by giving you a number of warriors from their supply, matching the price that you've set. You'll then place them in the payments box, or in the case of Vagabond, they'll exhaust a matching number of items and you'll place that many otters in your payments. Each player can purchase one service per turn, plus one more for each clearing on the board with a trade post and any of their pieces. So in this case, the cats could purchase three services. So what are these services? Well, let's start with cards. Unlike other factions, your hand of cards is public. Use the stand to display your cards to everyone else. This is because other players can buy your cards off of you. Each card purchase counting as one service. Very useful. But remember, there's nothing stopping them from then using those cards against you, and due to rampant corruption in your company, you can't stop anyone from buying things. So be careful. Next up, we have river boats. If a player buys these, for the rest of their turn, their warriors can travel along the river as if it were a normal path. And lastly, they can hire your warriors as mercenaries, meaning that they can use your units in battle and they count towards ruling a clearing. But they won't be able to move your otters anywhere, so make sure other players know that. Now, let's say the mice have hired your mercenaries and use them to fight in this clearing. When taking hits, the buyer must split the damage between their units and yours, starting with them. So, if they took three damage, they'd lose two mice and you'd lose one otter. Okay, now that we know what you have for sale, let's talk about what you can do with all that cash you're gonna earn. At the start of Birdsong, if you have nothing in your payments box, place two warriors there. Then score dividends, meaning for every two warriors in your funds box, score one point. The catch is, you also have to have at least one trade post on the board. If you don't, you score nothing. On the first turn, you won't have either of these things, but eventually you can build up quite a portfolio. After that, we gather funds. Move all warriors on your board to the funds box. These funds are going to fuel your actions during daylight, so let's keep going. During daylight, you can commit a fund to do some basic things like move, battle, or draw a card. When you commit a fund, place it in the commitments box. You can also commit funds to craft cards, placing warriors on empty trade post spaces to show that you've used them. And if you don't actually want the card you craft, you can choose to discard it to place a warrior in payments. All of these committed warriors will go back to your funds when you gather them next turn. Some actions require you to spend funds though, which means you have to give the warriors back to their owners. You can spend one fund to recruit a warrior in any clearing with a river, and you can spend two funds to build a trade post. The funds you spend have to belong to the owner of that clearing, and the clearing can't already have a trade post in it. You also place a warrior in that space and score two points. These trade posts are valuable for everyone, but if people sour on you, they might try to destroy them, so try not to leave them undefended. If a trade post does get destroyed, it's bad news for you. The post is removed from the game and you lose half of your funds. The only upside to this is that even though the trade post is gone forever, the fact that you have empty spaces on your player board means you can still use them for crafting. Then during evening, discard down to five cards and set your service costs to whatever you want. Feel free to negotiate with your fellow players on this. Now notice I didn't say you draw cards. Unlike other factions, the river folk don't have an automatic draw. They only draw cards by committing funds, so keep that in your calculations. And lastly, I've already talked about your public hand, so the only special rule to mention is that otters can swim, so you can always treat rivers as if they were normal paths. And that's the River Folk Company. Extort your friends, use their warriors as indentured servants, dive into your piles of money like Scrooge McDuck. And that's also the end of the River Folk expansion. 
If you're a Patreon backer watching this video early, thank you so much for donating. If not, you've had to wait a month for this video to go live, and I am sorry. So, if you want to join my Army of Rules lawyers and get to see the exclusive videos a month early, well, the link should be somewhere near my face. Regardless, thank you all so much for watching. The next game I'm teaching, as voted on by my rules,